Hello everyone. This week we reach the end of our journey through Kortwaka with a consideration of the post Shinkokinshu age. In one sense, this period lasts from the early 1200s right up until the present day, because poems in the 575777 form on traditional subjects and using traditional diction and imagery are still being composed, alongside poems in that form using modern diction and images, tanka. On the other hand, it's perhaps better to draw a line under Waka in 1439, the year in which marked the completion of the final imperial anthology, Shinshoku Kokinshu, or the new continued ancient and modern collection. Yet, in another sense, one could also draw a line under Court Waka 90 years earlier than this in 1349, the year when the 17th anthology, Fugashu, the collection of elegant styles, was completed, as all subsequent anthologies were compiled after the emperors concerned were urged to do so by a shogun and were thus not entirely court projects. So, as you can see, the situation is complex, and that's before we even get on to the topic of how the world of Waka changed or didn't change after Shinko Kinshu. The world of Waka, of course, did not exist in isolation from the social and political changes going on in Japan at the time, something which I hope should be clear after what I had to say last week about Shinko Kinshu's genesis. In this age, however, the world of Waka itself was riven by even more intense conflict than it had been during that of the late 12th century, a conflict which was especially bitter because at its roots lay more than just a disagreement over literary matters. The arguments between the Mikohidari and the Rokujo have been over poetic style and access to patronage at court. In this age, to these causes was added another source of dispute, family disagreement, and competing claims on inheritance. What I'm going to attempt to do then in this talk is trace these multiple strands in parallel before outlining some of the key features of at least some of the poetry of the age and how it differed from that of earlier times. And there's a lot to get through. I seem to say that every week, don't I? So let's get started. Where should I begin? Let's start with the family. But whose family? If you remember what I said last week, then you should already know. The family is that of Fujiwara no Teika. He was awarded the honour of being sole compiler of the first post Shinkokinshu anthology, Shinchoku Senshu, the new imperial anthology completed in 1235, making him the only poet in history to be involved in the compilation of two anthologies. It aroused some controversy because it excluded any poetry by poets, and particularly members of the imperial family, who had been on the losing side in Gotoba's rebellion against the shogunate in 1221. This was seen as a slight by Teika to Gotoba and the others, although it seems likely that the decision was taken by others, principally the then regent Kujo Norizane and his father Michi'ie, who were nervous about upsetting the Bakufu by being seen to be partial to the exiled emperor. But it's also true that bad blood had existed between Teika and his one-time patron for some time. If you remember, Teika had refused to attend Gotoba's Shinkokinshu banquet in 1205 on the grounds that the anthology was not properly finished then. Later, he was annoyed when Gotoba encouraged his son Tamei to play the aristocratic sport of kemari or football, causing him to neglect his poetic training. Once Gotoba was exiled to Oki, Teika cut him off completely, never writing to him again. This is in contrast to, for example, Fujiwara no Ietaka, who corresponded regularly with him on poetic matters. There's no doubt this annoyed the former emperor. In Gotoba no In Gokuden, former Emperor Gotoba's secret teachings, a treatise which he wrote towards the end of his life, Gotoba correctly remarks that Taker is in a class by himself, and his master of the art was remarkable, but then writes that the way he behaved, as if he knew all about poetry, was really extraordinary. Especially when he was defending his own opinion, he would act like the man who insisted a stag was a horse. He was utterly oblivious of others and would exceed all reason. The translation there isn't mine, but by Robert Brower in his excellent article, Ex-Emperor Gotoba's Secret Teachings in the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies, which I strongly recommend if you want to read more of Gotoba's opinions about poetry and the poets of his time. In any case, despite Taker's concerns over his son's predilection for football rather than poetry, Tamei did finally prove himself worthy of inheriting his father's poetic legacy, becoming the Mikohadari standard bearer. Tamei had three sons, 
as you can see here, Tame Uji, Tame Nori, and Tameske, each of whom founded their own separate families, the Nijo, the Kyogoku, and the Reze. And Tameske was the child of Tame Ie's old age. He was 65 when he was born, and the new brother's arrival was discomforting for his brothers, especially so when Tame Ie, who had a somewhat strained relationship with his eldest son by this point, altered his will several times and eventually settled a valuable estate in Hosokawa, one of the family's main sources of income, on Tameske. The family conflicts were compounded when, before his death, Tamei passed on to Tameske's mother, a truly formidable woman who we now know as the Abutsuni, or the nun Abutsu, a trove of documents on poetry he had received from his father Teika. This outraged the Nijo, the senior branch of the family, because they regarded themselves as the true and appropriate guardians of Teika's legacy, and his legacy was, in one sense, the most valuable thing the family possessed. It consisted of copies of Taker's own poetry, copies of his writings on poetry, and his copies of other manuscripts. Given Taker's authority, this represented everything that Waka was, and thus ownership of it meant that the possessor had unparalleled authority over the forms and could potentially shape it in the way that they wished. That a significant part of it had been passed on to the Reze was a dangerous diminution of the Nijor's authority. Not surprisingly, the Nijo wanted the material back and promptly launched a lawsuit to demand that Abutsu return the documents to what they saw as their rightful keeping, claiming that she had stolen them. The Reze, of course, re rejected this, stating that as a branch of the Mikohidari family descended from Taker, they had just as much right to a portion of his legacy as the Nijo did. The situation was complicated, however, by the fact that Tamae had given the Reze, or Abutsu had taken, depending upon your point of view, not only the documents, but also the catalogue listing what the documents there were. So the Nijo were in the position of demanding, and suing for, the return of unspecified documents which they could not identify. Alongside this lawsuit, the Reze sued the Nijo to get them to honour the terms of Tamae's will, and pass the Hosokawa estate on to Tameske. Abutsu lost both legal cases in Kyoto, with the courts there siding with the Nijo and requiring the return of the poetic documents and also confirming their title to the Hosokawa estate. This was on the basis that courtier law only allowed a father to disinherit his principal heir under specific circumstances, clearly demonstrable unfilial conduct. This was not the end of the story, however, because there was a further option to appeal the land judgment to the shogunal courts in Kamakura, which is what Abutsu did. A warrior law allowed a father to change his will at any time and for any reason, and decide who his heir or heirs were. On this basis, Tamae's final will in favour of Tameske should stand. The lawsuit over the Hosokawa estate rumbled on in the shogunal courts for about 40 years, with successes in reversals on appeal, the Nijo submitting forged versions of letters by Tamae to bolster their case, and other shenanigans going on. Abutsu died in 1283, before the case was settled, but passed the banner on to Tameske, who eventually received a definitive judgment in his, in the Reze's favour, in 1313. The Nijo-Reze lawsuit is a fascinating subject for study, because so much of the documentation concerning it has survived the vagaries of history, so we know in a great deal of detail what the submitted evidence was, the legal basis for the claims, and the arguments the two parties made, and the reasoning of the courts in reaching their decisions. It shows how land ownership, the basis for wealth in agrarian Japan, was ceasing to be adjudicated according to courtier law, but instead by the law of the Bakufu, the samurai government. And this is tangible illustration of the way in which the prerogatives of the nobility in Kyoto were being encroached upon and even eliminated by the warriors in Kamakura and the provinces. But what, you may be asking, does this protracted legal inheritance dispute have to do with poetry? Well, in order to successfully prosecute their cases, representatives of both the Nijo and the Reze had to remove to Kamakura and essentially live there rather than Kyoto. This brought the scions of the senior poetic families from the capital into regular and close contact with senior warrior lords. In fact, close contact between the upper echelons of the Bakufu and the poetic elite of the court had been forged two generations earlier, as Taker had acted as waka tutor to Minamoto no Sanetomo, the third Kamakura shogun.
You might remember that I mentioned him in another video as a tragic figure who produced some 720 waka between the ages of 17 and 22, but then lapsed into alcoholism and depression before being assassinated by his nephew at the age of 26. In any case, the close contact between Taker's descendants and the warriors in Kamakura as a result of the lawsuit meant that samurai with a hunger for the cultural kudos that knowledge of and ability in waka brought had access to the sources of it. In turn, this provided the increasingly impoverished poetic families with access to other sources of income through tutoring, writing poems to order, and even in some cases, selling some of Taker's documents for cash. This increased the circulation of waka beyond the court circle and played a part in its dissemination to the wider upper class population, and hence its acceptance as one of the principal keystones of broader Japanese culture. If you remember, I mentioned the dispute between the Nijō and Reize over the ownership of documents bequeathed by Taker. What actually happened as a result of this is somewhat murky. According to partisan Nijō accounts, right, written sometime after the events took place, the Reize took advantage of the Nijō's ignorance of what they did or didn't have to simply forge a number of texts and pass these back, claiming them to be by Taker. This was the orthodox view of much Waka scholarship for many years, placing responsibility on the Reze, circulation and promotion of fraudulent material for the muddying of Taker's legacy, leading to many medieval commentaries heading off down esoteric blind alleys. More recent scholarship, though, puts a more charitable interpretation on things, suggesting that both branches of the family produced Taker forgeries, but that they did so to meet the appetite for Taker materials among the warrior elite. It suggested that, as expert and experienced poets familiar with Taker's genuine works, neither side would have been fooled by forgeries for long, if at all. But once a fraudulent document had been sold to a powerful warrior lord as the genuine article, it was in neither side's interest to claim it was false, because it might call into question whether the documents which they did have possession of were real, and thus strike at the basis of their claims to be Taker's inheritors and the true guardians of Waka's legacy. The result is that, even today, the authenticity of at least two key texts, Maigetsusho, Monthly Notes, and Teika Jite, Teika's Ten Styles, is disputed, and these join a collection of works which are clearly fraudulent. Paul Atkins, in his groundbreaking study, Teika, The Life and Works of a Medieval Japanese Poet, covers this in detail, and I strongly recommend taking a look at this if you want to know more. Regardless of the authenticity or not of individual treatises on poetics, what the circulation of forgeries shows is the continuing hunger for knowledge about waka and its continuing importance as a vehicle of culture and status. Unfortunately, what the split of the Mikohodari house into competing factions also meant was that a division developed over poetic vision, what waka should be and what good poetry was. Broadly speaking, this division was between the Nijo on one side and the Kyogoku Reze on the other. Despite the Mikohodari's origins as poetic innovators against Rokujo conservatism, the Nijo branch turned into rigid guardians of poetry as elucidated by Taker and Shunze. For them, Waka had reached perfection under Taker, and thus there was no need for any further changes. What was needed was active preservation to make certain that the art was not solid by anything new. Naturally, the Kyogoku Reze took the opposite view, that poetry, waka, could and should evolve, and new styles were needed for a new age. As the senior branch of the family, the Nijo had the most authority, as well as the closest links with the imperial family, so it was their view which largely dominated. Here's a list of the post Shinkokinshu anthologies. I've already mentioned the first, Shinchoku Senshu. What do you notice about the others? Here's a clue, the titles of the first eight anthologies, the Hachidaishu. Now let's go back to the post Shinkokinshu anthologies. Leaving aside the first, the titles of all the others, bar two, derive from the titles of one or other of the Hachidaishu, but are either new, Shin, or continued, Shoku, or finally both with the last anthology. And the titular resemblance is deliberate and emblematic of the Nijo belief that the finest waka to were to be found in the past, and all that the poets of the present needed to do was repeat the classical models in order to excel. Nijo poets were selected as compilers of ten of the subsequent imperial anthologies, against one, Gyoku Yoshu, which was compiled by a Kyogoku poet, and one, Fugashu, which was compiled by an emperor, while the Reize, much to their chagrin, 
never managed to earn a commission. That this pattern occurred was largely because the Nijo were more politically astute and supported the branch of the imperial family which was in the ascendant, and thus tended to supply candidates for the throne. Personalities and character, however, also had something to do with it. For example, at the beginning of the 14th century, the leader of the Kyogoku family was Kyogoku Tamekane. Tamekane had two passions, poetry, of course, and political intrigue, and it was the latter of these two passions that led him to twice be exiled for plotting in various ways. In 1303, he returned to the capital from his latest exile to find that the Nijo had, in the person of the family's then leader, Nijo Tameyo, been honoured by Emperor Gouda with a commission for an imperial anthology, which became Shingo Senshu. To say Tamekane was disgruntled would be an understatement, and he was vocal in his public criticism of the quality of the latest Nijo offering. Only a few years later, Emperor Hanazono, who was a gifted poet in his own right and had learned poetry from Tamekane, came to the throne and proposed commissioning an, an anthology from him. Nijo Tameo was outraged and submitted a memorial to the throne claiming that a criminal such as Tamekane was unworthy of such an honour. And Tamekane submitted a response suggesting that Tameo's outrageous slurs were the result of mental incompetence. And Tameo replied in similar vein until fully 11 claims and counterclaims had gone back and forth. Meanwhile, the Reze leader Tameske also got involved, attempting to have the commission awarded to him, and even used the contacts he had in Kamakura as a result of his ongoing lawsuit with the Nijo to attempt to get the Bakufu to intervene in his favour. Tamekame also supported this option briefly, if only to make sure that the Nijo were unsuccessful, but when the Bakufu stated that this was a matter for the court to decide, he resumed promoting his own candidacy, and eventually won out after gaining the support of one of the more powerful figures at court at the time, Sayonji Sanekane. Tameo was so angry when Tamekane was awarded the commission for Gokyoku that he resigned all his court positions and retired in a huff. It's not, perhaps not surprising then that 30 years later, when Emperor Korgon desired to commission an anthology with the support of Emperor Hanazono, that after an initial attempt to heal the breach between the feuding poetic families by having Nijo Tamemoto and Reze Tamehide involved as compilers, Hanazono took over the job after the poets were completely unable to agree on anything. Modern Waka scholarship has tended to view the Nijo anthologies as stale and essentially proof of the ossification of Waka in the early medieval period, focusing instead upon the study of the Kyogoku Reze poetry in Gyoku Yoshu and Fugashu. Recent years have seen something of a re-evaluation of these works' contents, in particular as guides to who was and wasn't in favour at court, and to a lesser extent at the Bakufu at the time, which brings us rather neatly back to politics. As you may know, the Mongols under Kublai Khan twice attempted to invade Japan in 1274 and 1281. If you're a video game fan, I'm sure you'll be familiar with Ghost of Tsushima, which is set in the opening stages of the first invasion when the Mongols invaded and conquered the island of Tsushima without much difficulty. Sadly, in real life, there is no equivalent to the game's heroic protagonist, Sakai Jin. In fact, one of the reasons that the Reize's case in the Shogunal court of Kamakura took so long was that official attention was distracted by repelling the first invasion, preparing a defence against the second, and then fighting it off. A more important consequence, though, was that the drain on the Shogunate's resources and its inability to reward its vassals for their contribution to the defence magnified discontent against its rule, although it took decades for this to reach the point where a rebellion could take place. But rebellion indeed there was, and it was triggered by yet another attempt by the imperial family to restore their prerogatives under Emperor Godaigo. Now, a detailed account of all the characters, betrayals, battles, defeats and victories which this kicked off would take hours, so I'll just provide a very brief summary. The first stage resulted in the downfall of the Kamakura Bakufu in 1333, bringing an end to its 148-year rule of Japan. This ushered in what became known as the Kemu Restoration, Kemu no Shinsei, which was Godaigo's attempt to assert imperial primacy over the various territorial samurai lords. Unfortunately for him, however, the military forces which had supported the restoration largely came from samurai lords, who were dissatisfied at being excluded from the Godaigo's envisioned new imperial order. Matters eventually came to a head when one of the Godaigo's former supporters, Ashikaga Takauji, rebelled against him 
This eventually resulted in Godaigo fleeing Kyoto in 1336 and Takauji establishing the Ashikaga or Muromachi Shogunate in Kyoto, ushering in a new period of military rule over the country, although the Ashikaga's control was always much more tentative than the Kamakura Shogun's had been. When Godaigo fled Kyoto, he took with him the imperial regalia, the mirror, sword and jewel, which were the symbols of imperial rulership. As an aside, the sword was a replacement, as the original had been lost at Dan no Ura, as Antoku had it, had it with him when he was drowned, but the symbolic importance of the regalia was not to be denied. Possession of them allowed Godaigo to set up an alternative court in Yoshino, ushering in what we now know as the Nambokucho period, or the period of southern and northern courts, when, when Japan had two emperors, as you can see here. There was intermittent military conflict between the two courts throughout the period of their existence, with both sides naturally claiming that the other was illegitimate. The conflict was eventually settled when the southern emperor Gokameyama abdicated in favour of northern emperor Gokomatsu, on the basis that the latter had promised that the position of emperor would alternate between candidates from the northern and southern lines of the family. Gokumatsu reneged on this promise, and in fact all subsequent emperors have come from the northern line, although it is the southern emperors who are now officially regarded as legitimate due to their possession of the regalia, while the northern emperors are considered to be pretenders. While the conflict between the courts was going on, however, both sides were keen on bolstering their claims to legitimacy, and one way the northern court did this was through the promotion of poetry. Although, although if we go back to our list of imperial anthologies, we can see that the final four anthologies were not entirely imperial projects. It was, in fact, the Ashikaga shoguns of the time who proposed them and the emperors who agreed, as they had little choice, but to do what their warrior overlords wanted. The fact that the shoguns took over the promotion of poetic activities, however, just serves to demonstrate Waka's enduring power as a means of asserting a ruler's status and authority. We've now cycled back to poetry again. Earlier, I said that Nijo-style poetry emulated, to a slavish extent, that produced by their illustrious forebear taker and was essentially a backwards-looking art form seeking to preserve the glories of the past tradition. As the features of this style of poetry will be familiar to you from looking at the waka of earlier times, I'm going to put it aside and concentrate instead upon that produced by the Kyogoku Reize schools, which aroused such ire in their Nijo compatriots. Going back to Ryoku Yoshu, the anthology compiled by Kyogoku Taikane, the Nijo criticised its poems for using new diction, failing to handle imagery in the traditional manner, repeating sounds or syllables inappropriately, having too forceful breaks between lines, and using rough or vulgar language. They even felt that the title was insufficiently traditional and their poems were ordered unsuitably. But what were the key features of Kyogoku Reize poetry? Well, this is a complex topic, but to put it simply, it comes down to two elements, intensity of focus and what that means for the treatment of imagery. Compared to the poets of earlier times or their Nijo contemporaries, the Kyogoku Reize attempted to capture the totality of a single instant in depth. In practice, this meant that their seasonal poetry often contains nothing but a sequence of images, as the poet tries to describe everything he or she perceives in that moment. It also means that, because of the preponderance of imagery in many poems, there is little option but to define them as miscellaneous, um, because the imagistic range is beyond what the tradition expected for a strictly seasonal or other defined type of poem. In love poetry, that intensity is turned inward to the poet's emotions, which leaves no room for the metaphorical use of natural and other phenomena, which had been a staple of love poetry ever since Manyoshu. Let's take a look at a few examples to see what this means in practice. Here's a seasonal poem by Tamekane. From among his summer poems. Eda ni moru, asahi no kage mo, sukunasa ni, suzushi sa fukaki take no oku kana. Leaking through the branches, the morning sunlight is scanty upon the depths of coolness deep within the bamboo grove. His focus is fixed upon the moment he stands in the bamboo, feeling the coolness while only brief shafts of sunlight penetrate the canopy and reach the place where he stands. There is no room for anything else because of the intensity of the moment. Here's another example. From among his miscellaneous poems. Kure nuruka magaki no take no murusuzume, negura arasou koe sawagunari. Is it dusk? 
along the bamboo of my lattice fence, a flock of sparrows quarrelling over roosts is chirping noisily, indeed. Sparrows, as a piece of diction, was not unknown in Waka. Gien uses it in one in his po of his poems in the Poetry Contest in 600 Rounds, but his opponents reject it as inappropriate, while Shunze calls it colloquial. It's not surprising, then, that Nijo purists would regard this encapsulation of an evening moment as prosaic. There were unprecedented uses of diction too, however. Topic unknown. Atomo naki, shizu ga ieie no take no kaki, inu no koe no mi oku fukaku shite. Not a trace remains of the peasants' huts, bamboo fences, simply a dog barking from deep within. This is the only waka in an imperial anthology to refer to a dog, and one of the very few in total that do, too. In addition, the poem is remarkable for its focus on the peasants' dwellings and their dilapidated state. It's a far cry from the elegant and lyrical de descriptions of prior waka. Originality did not just come purely from dictional usage, though. Here's a poem on wind by Emperor Fushimi. On wind from among his former majesty's miscellaneous poems. Hibiki kuru matsu no ure yori fuki yochite kusa ni koe yamu yama no shitakaze. Echoes come from the prime branch tips as, gusting down and losing its voice among the grass, is the wind from off the mountains. The novelty here is in the description of the wind falling, gusting in my translation, and the image of it being silenced as it moves from the mountains, where it's powerful enough to shake the trees, to the plain below where it loses its force among the grasses. Here's a final example of this sort of poem. On Lightning Inazuma no shibashi mo tomenu hikari ni mo kusaba no tsuyu no kazu wa miekeri the lightning fails to linger for even a moment, yet, in its flash of light, upon every blade of grass, appeared numerous dewdrops. The poem captures a single intense instant in microcosm. Rather than focusing on the sight of the lightning in the sky or striking the ground, instead the poet's attention is on the grass at his feet, where the momentary illumination has been enough to allow him to count the drops of dew there. Let's look at a couple of love poems. On Waiting for Love night after night. Ware mo hito mo aware tsure naki yona yona yo tanome mo yamazu machi mo yo warazu. Me and him, how moving is our hard-heartedness night after night. Endlessly he makes me believe him, never weakening in waiting for him. This is a love poem, but the focus is entirely on the speaker's bitter expression of her emotions, hating that she is unable to take the step of understanding that her lover's promises to come to her are false. And there's a note of sarcasm, which would be absent in earlier waka, as well as a lack of any concrete imagery on which the emotions could be hung. Here's another example in the same vein. On the conception of love. Kyo wa moshi, shito mo iya ware o omoi izuru. Is it that today he has of me, with passion thought, that I too, far more than normal, yearn for him? Here the poet, still separated from her lover, wonders if her feelings are reciprocated, hoping that they are, but suspecting that they are not. Again, the poem lacks any concrete imagery. The final feature of Kyogoku Reze poetry I want to discuss is how the poets as compilers saw the relationship between individual waka when assembling them in sequences. Unlike in Shinko Kinshu, where poems were closely associated and linked through imagery and various progressions, the Kyogoku Reze compilers opted for an altogether different form of sequencing, which was sometimes combined with a new elusive technique. Their sequences tended to alternate groups of closely connected and only distantly or not connected at all poems to create an almost wave-like rhythm. However, sometimes there were hidden connections between seemingly unrelated poems. Take a look at these two poems from Fugashu. From among his love poems. Chigiri arite kakaru wo moiya tsukubane no mine no mo hito no yagate koishiki. Do we have a bond that arouses such passions? Though at the peak of Tsukuba, I see her not, yet I'm filled with constant longing. Next, there is a love poem 
from when he presented a hundred poem sequence. Shirare jina o saoru sode no namida ga wa shita ni wa hayaki mizu no kokoro wo no one knows, it seems, as I wipe away with my sleeves a river of tears. Beneath it, swift, are the waters of my heart. These poems follow each other directly at the beginning of the first book of love poetry in the anthology, and yet they seem completely unconnected. Both, however, can be seen as alluding to this very famous earlier poem by Emperor Yose. Sent to the Princess in the Fishing Pavilion Tsukubane no Mina yori yotsuru, mina no kawa, koi zo tsumorite, fuchi to nari keru. From the heights of Tsukuba, tumbling from the peak, comes the river Mina, man and woman's flow, swelling my love into a deep, still pool. Knowing the existence of this poem, triggered by the mention of Tsukuba in the first, transformed the, the river of tears in the second poem into the river Mina, and sets up a contrast between Yose's deep pool of love and the rushing of waters in the second. Recognition of this connection is only possible with an encyclopedic knowledge of waka, and an ability to bring the link into focus. This type of practice, which Brower and Minor term editorial illusion, is a feature of the way the Kyogoku Reze poets sought to go beyond individual poems and find novel ways of relating elements of the canon together. These sorts of editorial linkages, though, foreshadowed future developments in Japanese poetry, later in the 14th and early 15th centuries, as composition ceased to be a singular activity with the birth of linked verse or renga by pairs or groups of poets. That, though, is something I'll address in another video. See you soon.